The first lesson this morning is found in the book of Joel, chapter 2, beginning with verse 12. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the assembly. Bring together the elders. Gather the children those nursing at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Let the priest who minister before the Lord weep between the portico and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is your God? The word of the Lord. The psalm reading is uh, found in Psalm 42, beginning with verse 1. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and beat with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while the people say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. The word of the Lord. And the second lesson is found in the book of 1 John, chapter 2, beginning with verse 16. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The word of the Lord. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. All right. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. <clears throat> Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to test. When the devil had finished all his tempting, this tempting, he left him until a more opportune time. The Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. And let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we just come before you today, and oh, we're just overwhelmed by your presence. As we begin our Lenten journey, come, open up our minds, open up our hearts, Holy Spirit, awaken our faith inside of us, draw us close to your heart, and take me out of the way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, 
We were supposed to gather on Wednesday, and I had asked Barb to sing in Christ Alone. To me, to start Lent singing this awesome, amazing, powerful song about our Lord just felt so appropriate this year. Because the message of that hymn in so many ways, to me, is the battle cry of every believer's heart. It reminds us that our hope is found in Christ alone. In the fiercest storms that you and I will face, Christ alone is the cornerstone and the anchor of our hope and our strength, our courage and our peace, and they only can be found in Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer, and our Lord. We're going to begin our Lenten journey today. And as such, I ask to sing this powerful song because I know that there are some of you, like me, who are, who are approaching the season of Lent this year, and it feels like we've got burdens that are too heavy for us to bear by ourselves, so we need to be reminded that we don't bear them alone, but we bear them in the power and victory of Jesus. And there are some of us who will start this Lenten journey this morning, and we have fears and we have anxiety that we cannot overcome on our own. So we needed to be reminded that we don't do it in our power. We do it in the power of Jesus. Others of us have anxiety and concerns about what's going on in the world because it seems like it's completely out of control and there's chaos everywhere. And we need to know that we don't walk in this world by ourselves, but we walk hand in hand with Jesus every day. So yes, this morning I ask that we gather in the name of our Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and Lord, to sing this powerful song, to be reminded that there's more to the story of our lives than heartache and pain and brokenness and illness and death. There's more to the story of our lives than living in a world where evil sometimes feels like it triumphs more than good. We sing this song, we sing other songs like it, to be reminded that the message of the Christian faith is very simple. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life for on that bloody old rugged cross of Jesus Christ he defeated death and disease and chaos, and fear, and division, and despair, and sin, and brokenness. Therefore, the power of evil will never have the last word. Because of three simple words. He is risen. Forty days from now, we're going to be back in this place. We are going to be celebrating our Resurrection Easter Sunday. And when I shout, he is risen, you guys with all the passion in yourself, you are going to shout out what? That's right. 40 days from now. 40 days from now, our Lenten journey will have come to an end. And you and I will announce to the world once again that Jesus Christ defeated our greatest enemy of the world that this world has ever faced including sin and death and evil and the devil. And he did it when he rose again from the grave. 40 days from now. And yet, even knowing all of that that I just told you, even knowing that he defeated Satan, even knowing that he won the war, there, everyone in this room and everyone watching knows deep down in our souls that the world is still not right. It's still not what it should be yet. Yet, but there's more to the story. This Bible that we believe in, that we read, that we get encouragement from, that we, our faith is transformed from, this Bible tells us that the battle will rage in our souls and in this world until Jesus comes again. However, Lent is an invitation for you and I to step into an intentional season of preparation so that you and I can become battle ready, so we can take up our positions and stand firm with the weapons of the Holy Spirit and fight against this known enemy. So during the next 40 days, not counting Sundays, I know that, 
the next 40 days, the Holy Spirit's going to take us on a journey. He's going to take us deep into our own wilderness journey, and it's going to be characterized by worship and repentance, by scripture reading and fasting, and all of the things that you and I need to do to train our souls to be ready for the battle that you and I face every single day. And during the next 40 days, not only will we gather in the fellowship hall at 5.30 and have soup and fellowship together, we will then, as believers in Jesus Christ, come into the house of God, into this very place, and we will worship our Lord with our hands in the air and, our, and praises on our voice to our almighty God. We will seek him, yes, in prayer and fasting and repentance and studying God's word. But this year on Wednesday nights, we will be encouraged in our faith by the stories of people who walk among us with, whose lives were changed when Jesus walked up to them and said, come follow me. And they gave up all of their lives and they did just that. And they're going to tell us about what happened when Jesus came and changed their lives. And then we will be encouraged by that. No matter how you choose to participate in your Lenten journey this year, I pray this, that you will allow the Holy Spirit to come forcefully, powerfully into you to radically change your life and to radically transform each one of us more and more into the image of Christ. Why? Because our true identity is not as a person of the world, but our true identity is a child of the Most High God. He created us in his image. His DNA runs through our blood. We are his. We are disciples of Jesus Christ. We are God's people. We have been set apart from the world by the power of the Holy Spirit. We have been claimed by the Father. We've been redeemed by the Son. And we are transformed every day by the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we begin this Lenten journey that should have happened on Wednesday, but because of the snowstorm, we're here today instead. I want to tell you, yes, there are people in the world who think that going through Lent and having Ash Wednesday is a crazy thing because you can't find either one of them in the Bible, and I will absolutely agree with them. You're never going to find either one. However, the reason that we have this tradition in our faith life is because early on in the Christian faith, the church leaders recognized and acknowledged that God's people were in a battle. And so these early church leaders realized they needed a time to mobilize God's people because there was an established enemy coming against them day after day, moment after moment, relentlessly trying to invade their lives and destroy them. And those early church leaders described this enemy this way, the devil, the flesh, and the world. Those early church leaders enacted the season of Lent as a way to prepare God's people to fight this known enemy, and they taught God's people to fight with the weapons of the spirit found in Ephesians 6. If you want to know what it's like to fight with the armor of God, go there and study it over these next 40 days. The reality of what they did those early church leaders did when they instituted the season of Lent is so powerful for us today. And I feel like it's never been more relevant than this year. You see, the war has been won by Jesus Christ, but we all know that daily the battle rages on. And herein lies the problem in our life, right? The enemy's tactics are real, and they create real collateral damage, not just in the world, but in our lives and in our marriages and in our homes as well. There's an author, Theo Hobson. He wrote a book called Reinventing Liberal Christianity, and in it he wrote this about our problem. He said, what, used, what was universally condemned is now celebrated. What was universally celebrated is now condemned. And those who refuse to celebrate are also condemned. No wonder we're so confused. And at times it feels like we have stepped into some vortex. It's hard to recognize our world and our culture at times. 
And no wonder God calls us this year to get battle ready. Because now more than ever, the devil has been relentless in his quest to destroy us. But praise God. <laughs> See, there's always a but. Praise God. We have a Savior, and his name is Jesus Christ. And he is well acquainted with our struggle and with our battle. You see, we just read about it. After he was baptized, he was sent out into the wilderness, and for 40 days he fought the enemy that you and I fight on a daily basis. And we use his story today as a framework for us to learn how to battle this enemy that we are facing. He had just been baptized by his cousin John, came up out of the waters of the Jordan River. Remember the heavens open up, the dove comes down, and there's a voice that says what? This is my son. I love him, and I am well pleased with him. The dad, his dad, declared to the world his identity. This is my son. You know, it's important to know our identity. It's important to know where we come from. Because if you don't know where you, where you come from, and if you don't know where your identity is in the battle that we are fighting right now, you're going to get lost. And you're going to not know what your purpose is. And so today, as we begin our Lenten journey, we unapologetically declare this to the world and to each other. We are made in the image of God. We are precious in His sight. We are unconditionally loved by our Father in Heaven, and we belong to Jesus Christ. He paid a great price for us. We are forgiven by Him. We are called to be a part of this faith community where we live together side by side, walking day to day in and out of the joys and the hardships of our lives together as God's people, helping and sustaining, encouraging each other, loving each other until the day when he comes back. And I can't wait. It's going to be a glorious day. Luke tells us that after the Father established his identity as the Son of God, Jesus was immediately driven out into the wilderness, and he was attacked in the temptation story for 40 days by the devil. And during that time, Luke says he didn't eat anything. And at the end of those 40 days, I can't even imagine how hungry he was. And there in his hunger, in that vulnerability, came that enemy. And he saw an opportunity to deceive our Savior. The devil came to him the way he comes to us. And he says, if, if you are the Son of God, then tell the stone to become bread. Did you catch what he's doing here? Having just affirmed his identity from the Father, he brings this deceptive idea with that word, if. He's planting this deception in the mind of our Savior, trying to get him to give up his identity, trying to give in to and cave into those fleshly cravings. Our first John reading would call that the lust of the flesh. I don't know about you, but there are so many times when I have that deception come and I am tempted to give in to those cravings. This is the desire for instant gratification. And Jesus faced it, and so do we. I know that if you've been a Lutheran for any length of time, if you've been a believer for any length of time, especially around here, the pastors say, what are you going to give up for Lent? We even have discussions about that. We tell each other. You may think that we're just kind of doing it willy-nilly, but there's a purpose to it. I don't care if you give up Dr. Pepper or chocolate or sugar or TV or video games. I don't care what it is that you give up. The purpose in giving it up is to challenge that instant gratification mindset and to take, have the Holy Spirit take control of that part of us. It is us standing in front of the face of our enemy and saying, I will not be mastered by anything other than Jesus Christ, my master and him alone. 
Jesus teaches us how to fight against the lust of the flesh. He says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. You see, Jesus knew he, who he was, and he knew where to find his strength. And in the battle between Jesus and the devil, round one went to Jesus. If we turn to Matthew's gospel of this temptation story, we read that the devil took him next to the holy city, had him stand on the highest point of the temple, and again tempted him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. And then the Bible gets, or the devil gets into the Bible game. He did that with Eve. He does it with us all the time. He takes these words and he puts just enough of the truth and just enough of his lie to deceive us and to twist it. And so we start to doubt, is that really what God said? And is that really what he meant? He does it all the time. And if he did it to Jesus, we can be assured he's going to do it to us. The devil tried to deceive him, saying, For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so you will not strike your foot against a stone. Our first John reading calls us the lust of the eyes. It shows up in our daily struggles as envy and greed and jealousy and discontentment, a restlessness inside of us. We are being deceived into believing that things are never going to be the way that, they really, that we really want them to be. Jesus has an answer for this one as well. He says, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And with that, he won round two. Matthew tells us, then the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said, I will give you all of this. I've got the power and authority to do it. I will give it to you if you just bow down and worship me. It's all you have to do. John calls this the pride of life. And whether it's lust of the eyes or lust of the flesh or pride of life, it all comes from the world, John says, not from the Father. This was the temptation for Jesus to give up his worship of his Father and worship the devil. He said, I will give you glory and instant awe of humankind. I will make you a celebrity. And boy, is that not a temptation in our society today. All you need is a camera and YouTube or TikTok or Instagram or whatever it is that you want to post yourself on. And whoa, you got millions of followers if you do it just right. Instant celebrity. Instant temptation. But at what price? At what price? do we pay when we want to be the hero of our own story? What price do we pay when we want to go our own way and do our own thing? You know, when we're doing this, it boils down to this. We are saying, God, I know how to manage my life better than you. <laughs> when that's happening, just maybe we ought to see what Jesus did when the devil tried to tempt him that way. Jesus has had it. He says, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And with that, round three went to Jesus as well. You see the tech? Did you see the tactics of the enemy? There's a deceptive idea that comes. There's an opening in our flesh, in our heart, or in our mind, a little hole, a little place where that deception can come, that distorted idea, or that view of ourselves, or the world, or that distorted view of God can seep in. And he gets it in there, and he twists it, and it seeps into our hearts and our minds, and then before we know it, it's normalized out into the world, and when that happens, the enemy has us just where he wants us. There's a battle raging on, even though the war has been won. But praise God. He has given us all that we need to defeat this known enemy, the world, the flesh, the devil. Praise God. He gives us everything we need in this season of Lent, this year, with an invitation to come Take up your position in this battlefield. Take up the full armor of God. Stand firm against the tactics of the devil. It's not against each other. It's not against flesh and blood. It's against the schemes of the enemy. 
And when we're thinking about this today, I need to be brutally honest with all of you. I've had to be brutally honest with myself this week as I've studied this. I need to tell you this. I don't care where you are on your faith journey. I don't care how many years you've been a believer. I don't care how many spiritual retreats you've been to. I don't care how many healing sessions you've been to. We all need to listen to what Luke says next. Luke chapter 4 verse 13 says, When the devil had finished all of this tempting, he left him unto a more opportune time. He left Jesus, went away, and watched until he had another opportunity to come back and do it all over again. And if he's that brazen with our Savior, can you imagine what it's like for us? He's relentless. But don't lose hope. Because as relentless as the devil is, our Savior is twice as relentless in his pursuit of us. Take heart. We are pursued by our God who comes to offer us every single day mercy and grace and forgiveness and strength. We are pursued by our God who will stop at nothing to see his children thrive. We are loved and pursued by our God, who is our refuge. He's our strength. He's our very present help in times of trouble. We run to him this Lent. Our God loves us, and he loves the world so much that he sent his son to die for the world and for us. This is the God who pursues us. This is the God who claims us. This is the God who has rescued us, who transforms us and renews us and changes us more and more into the image of God. This is who we serve. This is who we belong to. And 40 days from now, you and I are going to gather in this place to celebrate Resurrection Easter Sunday. And it may feel like a long time. But before that 40 days is up, you and I have a journey to take. We have temptations to face. We have battles to win. But do not do it on your own. I beg you, do not go through Lent on your own. Do it in the power and authority of Jesus Christ. Let the blood of the Lamb strengthen you and secure you as we fight these battles and we go through Lent this year because it is in the victory of Jesus that we're going to make it to the end. <laughs> I know 40 days from now seems like a long time, but guess what? Over and over and over in this powerful book called We Call the Bible, this love story of Jesus, and of God, we will find instances where God takes a 40-day period of time and he does amazing things with a group of people that he loves. And that's not just for people in the Bible. He's going to do it among us again this year. And I can't wait to watch him and be in awe of how he comes to strengthen us this Lent, these 40 days of transformation. In a couple of moments, you're going to be invited to stand up. And we're going to join our voices in a powerful song. We're going to join our voices in professing our faith, using the words of the Apostles' Creed. And then we are going to symbolically begin our Lenten journey, just like we would have on Wednesday. When you came in, you should have received a black rock. I want you to take that black rock out. This is a symbol of our brokenness and our separation from the Father. This is a symbol of our guilt and our shame, of our sin and our despair, and all of the things that we need to leave at the foot of the cross today. And you're going to be invited to come down this aisle, and when you get to the silver bowl, I'm going to ask you to throw this in there and leave it behind. Don't come back at the end of the service and pick it up. You're going to leave it behind. Yeah, you could throw it from there. I almost threw it from here at 8 o'clock. I was just going, ah! So we're going to do that. And then your second station, you're going to come to the baptismal font. There's no water in it today, but there are these clear rocks. 
And I'm going to ask you to leave behind your black one. I'm going to ask you to pick up this clear one. And I want you, you to keep this with you throughout these 40 days. Put it in your pocket. Put it in, on your nightstand, on your dresser, in your car, on your desk, backpack. I don't care. Put it somewhere where every single day you will touch it. And you will be reminded that Jesus won the war on the cross. Keep this rock with you to be reminded that in the waters of baptism, Christ made you his own. To be reminded that this dying and rising again that Martin Luther talks about it to new life is a daily occurrence with Jesus Christ. After you do that, you can take your place at the altar rail and we are gonna invite you to come and be nourished by the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And your final stop, if you choose to do it, will be at the ash stations where we will be reminded that God had the final word, that God declared the victory through Jesus, and he still makes beautiful things out of dust and ashes in the world and in our lives as well. Let's pray. Lord God, we're so grateful that you have not left us as orphans. We're so grateful you have not left us without weapons of the Spirit to fight with. I know it's easy to say everything's fine in my life. We're really good at talking that good game, telling everyone, oh, life's good, so good, no problems. But today we need to be brutally honest with you because we are fighting in a battle and we need you. So thank you, God, that you've given us the weapons of the Spirit to fight with. Thank you that you've given us this community of believers to journey with. Thank you that you've given us everything we need to take up our position and stand on these battlefields firm in the victory of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we, we accept your invitation for the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us through this season of Lent. And thank you that in 40 days we're going to be able to proclaim he is risen, he is risen indeed. Amen.